Hello everybody, welcome to St. Olaf's homework booklet number 12 video walkthrough. We're starting off with the comprehension section and let's summarise the text. It's basically about going around this wilderness and they're um, visiting their ancestral mansion and basically having a family reunion that was, um, while the place was quite uh, run down, it had... Um, untamed wilderness and it was from a bygone era it was the family reunion that breathed life back into it again so it's basically talking about the contrast between the family reunion that illuminated every the very corner out of humanity's reach um, compared to the big dilapidated building so let's start off with question number one what was the main theme of the passage so while the others are true to some extent, for example, the beauty of wildflowers in the wilderness, it's definitely touched upon um, the significance of these wildflowers. However, the main theme of the passage is focusing on this ancestral mansion, which we see over here. It talks about the point of the family reunion in the mansion and focusing on that mansion to explore that contrast between before and after. Therefore, overall, it's talking about the history and heritage of an ancestral um, mansion. These ones, for example, a stroll, they are touched on in the passage, but they are not the main theme of the passage. That's what we're trying to find over here. Question number two, lines four to five, wildflowers are described as a symphony of crimson, azure, and cold and golden hues. What is the literary device here? So just by elimination, we can cross out onomatopoeia, we can cross out alliteration, and when we have a symphony, are flowers really a symphony? No, but we're calling it a symphony to describe something that's gathered together in harmony. So it's not quite personification because, and it's not the simile because we don't have that like or as word, but symphony is a metaphor because it's comparing something to something else, not exactly personifying it because a symphony doesn't move like a human being or like an animal. So metaphor is the literary device here. So that's B. Question number two, how does the author describe the river? The text clearly states here that it was a symphony of the serpentine river, which had waters glistening like liquid sapphire, winding its sinuous path through the heart of this pristine wilderness. So it's very positively portrayed. That key word is seen here, though, that says as clear and shimmering like sapphire. In line nine, what word can replace cops? Now, let's go back. We can see this word being used over here amidst a cops of ancient oaks, and it seems to me like a small group. Or we can see here a cluster, a small group. It's not quite a forest because cops, it seems to be just like a small group, and a forest is a large group of trees. So we can say cluster instead of oak trees. In line 14, what does a phrase imbued with the faint aroma of antiquity suggest about the mansion? The key word here is going to be antiquity. We know the word antique and aroma is something to do with smell. Finding it over here, it says the air imbued with the faint aroma of antiquity. Let me just highlight this bore witness to the echoes of family law. So it's talking about how the air seems ancient. It's quite an old, dilapidated mansion. Therefore, the one that makes the most men uh, sense here is that it is old and has a historical atmosphere. It doesn't say anything about it being a tourist attraction. If anything, it's quite personal to this family who's having their reunion in it. Next uh question we have according to the passage the word chorus in line 23 probably refers to what so it says the late nights alive with the chorus of nocturnal creatures held us enthralled as the constellations above unfurled their celestial tapestry it's important to always go back you don't try and analyze the quotation by itself always place it in the rest of the text 
So although chorus does mean people singing in unison, in terms of the text, I think it's more it's more of a metaphor used to describe a, harmo- a harmonious way of nocturnal creatures chirping and rustling in the night. Because you could say foraging, or they don't really sing in unison, I don't think they're trying to say it literally, but all these things, this one, this one, and this one, you would hear the chirping and rustling from these three things. This one is the more broader general concept of the chorus in the night. Therefore, the solution would be D. Next question. What, uh, in line 24, does the word unfurled evoke in the passage? So, unfurled is over here. Unfurled, the celestial tapestry. We have a lot of things... It's quite a dynamic piece, things are moving around and unfurl means to unravel. So if you guys see a crunched up leaf and you can see an unfurled leaf, it's when, for example, a flower or a leaf starts to really bloom and grow and expand. Therefore, going back to the passage, if we're talking about unfurling, this has to mean the growth and expansion of something, particularly wildlife or maybe something with like a vine is unfurling. So C would make the sense option here. Stillness and stagnation is not as dynamic and it's definitely not closing or ending. So C. So what is the significance of the role of the mansion during the family reunion? They talk about it very positively. It is not a sense of a source of tension and conflict. Along here in the end of the text, it says that music was being played. It was sunny and there was... They were ensconced on the mansion's veranda. There was a lot of positive imagery here. Therefore, there's no tension being seen. Also, it doesn't really mention hiking and outdoor activities. That's not really the theme of the passage. And there's no historical reenactments going on. So while they are recounting their histories, perhaps, like in the family reunion, it is it provides a place for them to relax and enjoy the scenery above every, anything else. How does the author feel about the mansion and its history? They say that they carry a profound appreciation, let's do this in a different colour, for the beauty of the wild and the enduring legacy, and they had cherished memories. Therefore, they have a very, again, positive outlook of this mansion. They have appreciation, they have gratitude for housing them and allowing them to relax. Therefore, it's definitely not empty. And we have something else here other than just excited. It was He was grateful for his time. He appreciated the mansion. That's the key word, appreciate. So grateful would fit the best in this context. Question number 10. What is a phrase the inexorable march of time mean in line 27 in the context of the passage? This is in fact the inexorable march of time. What, so what does that mean in line 27? So we focus here, its grandeur is slightly dimmed by the inexorable march of time. So what does that sound like? It sounds to me as something, the march of time is ongoing. It's unable to be stopped. So it doesn't seem to me that it's moving backwards or it's rapidly deteriorating. It said slightly dimmed. Therefore, the thing that makes the most sense is the time is passing without pause or mercy. It's something that cannot be stopped. Time is still standing still in the wilderness. That doesn't really make sense because it's saying that it is deteriorating the mansion. Not rapidly, but it's not standing still. We can see the passing of time and it's not becoming more beautiful with age because he says that the grandeur was slightly dimmed. Dimmed means to go down. So C would be the option. So in lines four to five, a symphony of crimson, azure and golden hues is used to describe the landscape. What more things can be described in the in this way? Mark two answers. So crimson is red, um, blue, azure is a type of blue, and then golden, that speaks for itself. So what would be the same? So for this one, I would argue a sunset over the ocean has lots of, it goes between from going from this blue to this reddish color and gold if you've ever seen a sunset before it goes from blue to sort of a golden period back to another blue hour so i would say a sunset and then number two autumn when i hear of autumn i instantly think 
oranges, reds, golds, if you've ever seen a really colourful autumn tree. So I would also say autumn as well. The others do make sense. However, they don't apply as much as the rest of these. A symphony, if anything, a cityscape to me is quite choppy. It's not as natural as autumn leaves or a sunset. So which language devices, this is question 12, is not used in the passage? We're going to mark two answers. I do not see, I see a lot of personification and I see a lot of uh, metaphors, but I do not see any similes. We do not have any like. You can go back and check and hyperbole. What does hyperbole mean? It means exaggerating something, which with the metaphors we see quite a lot of. Um, we see a lot of metaphors, it was in a past question. And then parallelism is more to do with uh, in poetry, where we have rhythms and meters and sounds and structures. So it, this, because this is quite a lengthy passage, we don't have any structural techniques here like parallelism. So we can cross these out and we can see that irony. Irony is normally meant for, it's a comedic technique. And this passage is quite sincere. He's talking very earnestly he's not really making any jokes he's talking about how he's quite passionate and appreciative and then simile oh i said we don't see any similes we don't see any likes or um as so it would be similes and irony isn't the only things we're not seeing in this passage we are starting off with the math section with question number 13 and we are we have here that our scale is one to three and i just like to label centimeters and miles and so if we have seven centimeters on each side we have to multiply by seven so if on this side we have to multiply by seven we have to multiply by seven on the other side which gives us 21 miles 21 miles with the unit so the way I normally do um, scale questions, so we have centimeter to kilometer. I'm going to write here one centimeter, so this is centimeter. And to get to kilometers, we know that one centimeter is equal to 100. Oh, uh, let's make that one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. And then we also know that um, 100 centimeters is equal to one meter. We are trying to find out a kilometer, right? So one meter is there. So a thousand meters, which is one kilometer, a thousand meters is equal to a thousand meters is equal to how many centimeters we have to add on one two three zero so multiply by a thousand we need to multiply this by a thousand two and that essentially means adding on three zeros one two three so to find out that's one kilometer one kilometer is equal to one hundred thousand centimeters therefore two kilometers is equal to two hundred thousand how many zeros is that that's five zeros Therefore, the scale has to be 1, 2, 2 with 5 zeros next to it. So that's going to be 200,000. Just like that. So if we know 1 centimeter is equal to 2 kilometers, to get 5.5 centimeters, we have to multiply both sides by 5.5, multiply by 5.5, and 5.5 multiplied by 2 is 11, therefore 5.5 centimeters is equal to 11 kilometers. So for a height of a door and also for like a person, we tend to use meters because kilometers is way too large. So let's write that in, meters is way too large. Um, the weight of a mouse, we can do this in kilograms because we have different varying sizes of mice. I think grams would be too small. And if you have tons, you know, you have tons to measure 
um, cars because tons is thousands of kgs and the volume of water in a kettle if you've ever poured um, bottles of water kettles are similar we use liters and that's for l-i-t-r-e-s so one centimeter is equal to actually i keep on saying that's one meter is equal to 100 centimeters so i just wrote that out a little bigger so if three meters is equal to if we would want to find three meters we have to multiply both sides by three and we get 300 centimeters so three meters equal to 300 centimeters next one eight kilometers into is equal to how many meters so we have eight times because in one kilometer it's 1000 meters so kilo means a thousand and centi means a hundred so those are clues this is going to be equal to eight thousand so that's eight with three zero meters like that 350 centimeters into meters so a hundred centimeters a hundred centimeters is equal to one meter to get to 350 we need to multiply by, you'll notice, 3.5. So if we multiply by 3.5, that means we get 3.5. You can also do this in the way where centimeters to meters, you just divide by 100. So if the decimal place is here, we go one space, two space, decimal point will go over here. So we get 3.5 meters. Next, we have 200 milliliters into centimeters. So it's the same thing. To get from um, millimetres to centimetres, we have to divide by 10. So that would give us 20 centimetres. For this one, let's do 1 centimetre to 1... So 100 centimetres make up a metre. We know that here, let's just write it down again to help us, 100 centimetres equal to one metre. We have to multiply both sides by 50 because we need 50 metres. So we get 50, you'll see, and then we multiply by 100, you add two zeros. So we get one, two, five thousand. Therefore, this would be the option. We know that one centimetre is equal to 50 metres. However, how many is the question asking for? It's 4.5. So we need to multiply 50 by 4.5. So when we multiply 50 by 4.5, let's put a multiply sign here, we get 225 metres. That's the answer. So for this one, I always like drawing a diagram. At halfway full, it gives us 4.5 kg. And if we add, oh, let's be careful here, the bucket itself weighs 100 kg. So when half filled with water, the bucket weighs 4.5 kg. How much water is actually, how much does it actually weigh in there? We need to do 4.5 kg, which is actually 4,500 grams, minus 800. The weight of the bucket to find out how much water subtract you get zero zero borrow from the four we get three we get three thousand and seven hundred grams that's only half but then to find full we have to do three thousand seven hundred multiplied by two to get the let's do this in a different color the full weight of the water which is 7400 however we're not done here we've got the full weight of the water we still need to add on this 800 grams so if we do plus 800 grams we get eight point actually let's not skip that step let's write down we get 8,200 grams and then since it hasn't specified which unit to give it in but just for 
corrections sake, let's say 8,200 grams is equal to 8.2 kg. So this is one of those sensible measurement questions. Most likely it's going to be kilometers because we don't really use miles here in the UK. So nine kilometers, meters, think about two towns from like London to Manchester. It will definitely be um, more than just using meters nine kilometers would be more sensible capacity of a small glass is about if you know milliliters liters is far too much for one glass the weight of an apple is about 120 grams kg is what you use to measure people so for apples it would be much less so grams and then the capacity of a bottle would be about liters if you ever seen a coke bottle we give it in liters so for this, let's write down the conversion, 1 to 4,000. Now, when the scale is given like this, the smaller one is going to be the centimetres. So it's 1 centimetre to um, its scale on in real life. So if we have times 9, we need to multiply that by the other side. So multiply by 9, and we get 3... 36 and then three zeros 36,000 however we're not done we, this is 36,000 centimeters how much is that in meters now uh, we know that to get from centimeters to meters we have to divide by a hundred so three six thousand divide sorry divide by a hundred because centi remember it means 100 and also we should just know that 100 centimeters is in a meter we cross it out and we cross out another zero and we're left with 360 meters there we go so on the scale we are about halfway between 20 and 40 therefore halfway between 20 and 30 is 40 it takes 10 to get here 10 to get there 30 kg and if we convert it into grams we know one gram is equal to how many oh i'm doing it again one kg is equal to one thousand because kilogram means one thousand therefore 30 kg is going to be equal to thirty thousand comma three zeros and there we have it, 30,000 grams. We're doing NVR spatial reasoning, starting off with the question number 28. We can already cross a few out because um, this one, C, D, and E have no white stars at all in their net, so they definitely can't be the answer. And what differentiates A from B if we um, fold this up to fold in then this trapezium would be upside down it would end up looking something like this on the side facing us instead of um, the right way up therefore a has to be the right answer even if we do bring this um, even if we make this white square the base and we make this the top when this one comes in this star will be in the wrong place as well so therefore it definitely has to be a we can go ahead and cross out B because we see a blank white square here. However, there is no blank white square over there. And for this one, imagine the one I see the most is we definitely can't have C because it there's no way that this diamond can be next to this grid square because when you put them down, they're sort of this face and that other face. So you can't really have them next to each other. Therefore, we can cross out C. If you notice that when we say this is, we're looking at it from this end, we this becomes our face facing us, and this will be at the top, and this will be on the left. Therefore, the only answer it can be is D. This one is being kind to us because we can just look at it straight from this angle. If we have this facing us, this triangle will... So this will be the front bit, this will be the top bit facing that way, and then this will connect these both squares to be on the left. Therefore, the answer has to be E. So we can definitely cross out C because this pentagon we can see is always pointing away from the star. However, this one you can see 
it's sort of, if you can imagine it going this way, it's pointing towards the star. If we also take B for example, if this is our top, then that means this pentagon has to fold downwards and you'll see that it'd be flipped around if it collapses in itself. So if it's flipped around, then it has to be pointing away from the star. So imagine we're looking at the net this way. If we, this is the bottom. So we can see in E, um, we, if we fold up these, uh, this pentagon, then we will have this on the, say we look at it, at it from this hand side. When we fold this uh, white bit all the way up, it will form, so this will be the side and then that white bit will fold all the way up to be the top. And then we can see that this pentagon is pointing up towards the white, which we can see over here, pointing up towards the white. And then this black bit forms a part of like what we see. So you have black, white on the top, and then on the left hand side, we have um, the pentagon post, uh, facing the white bit at the top. Therefore the answer has to be E. So we know that the black bit and the checkered bit can never connect because they are on opposite faces of the cube. And this side of the triangle, this this right angle, has to be touching the black bit, whereas in this one, the triangle is pointing towards the black bit, so it can't be E either. And if we look at it from this way, so C could work because we have... If we tilt your head and imagine we're looking at it from this way, this is our front um, panel. We look to the left, yes, we've got this checker bit, but then the smiley face has to be sideways. Um, in So the sideway smiley face would have to be like this rather than facing upward, so it can't be C either. What makes the most sense is looking at it this way. This checkered um, panel will form the top of this and then the white square will be on the left hand side we have circle white on the left grid on the top so it has to be a so these last squares are always going to wrap around to form the top and if we um, look at it sort of from here we have this square we're looking at it on the left hand side we have black and then the circle will be on the top therefore it has to be a so for 34, if this one is going to be on the left hand side, we're going to fold all the way over here because when we flip this down first, when we collapse it, this triangle will be pointing upwards just like it is over here. And then the pentagon is pointing towards the start. We're looking at it from this way. We're gonna collapse this so that the star is on the top this pentagon will fold in to be our front facing and then this triangle is going to fold all the way to be next to the star and then pointing towards it like it is in the example picture, therefore it is A. So this one we can look at it straight from the this angle, this is going to form what we are looking at, so the star at the front, black on the left, white on the top, so it has to be B. We can see here straight away that option E is the only one with a smiley face, therefore it has to be E. So imagine for 37, we are sort of, if you can imagine folding this in because these sides would fold in, um, the square, the circle would end up, sorry, the heart would end up being the right way around. So we get something where this little dip is facing the square, facing the star. And then this will fold in to have, we're looking at the heart from this way, the sun is at the top, and then the star is on the left hand side, therefore the answer is C. So we thought A could be an answer because when you fold this one all the way up, yes you get this heart facing the star, however if you were to look at it on this angle, um, this star would be on the right hand side, not on the left hand side. You would have the white square on the left hand side. Therefore, we can confirm C as the answer. Question one of the verbal reasoning section. We have to find a pattern over here and we always have A in the middle. That's fine, all of the solutions do. But I noticed that when we focus on this first letter over here, it goes Q, R, S, T, U. We should have U at the front, which means we can cross out this and that. Next, 
we have R, S, T, U. We're focusing on this N, so the last one has to be V. Therefore, the answer will be A. So, Suresh, let's draw a family tree. So, this is Suresh, and Suresh has a mother. And we're saying that there's a boy, he is the son of the only son of my mother. So Suresh is the only son. If that boy is the son, therefore Suresh is his father. So it'd be solution D. For question 40, we are going to draw another diagram. And for this, I'm going to write A is the brother of B, which is the sister of C. And as of now, we know, as of now, we know all their genders. Um, but C is the father of D. However, we do not know the gender of D. Therefore, although we might assume that A is the uncle, this is uncle because A is a guy, uh, we don't know that D is a niece or a nephew, therefore it will be cannot be determined. D is the solution. 41, let's draw another family tree. We're given some information. We have boy we have a daughter daughter we also have the father i'm just going to make some space over here father now we know this girl has an uncle so father of her uncle this is the father of her uncle that means her uncle has to be over here because it's a father of the uncle and the daughter. Therefore, if he's the son of the daughter of the father, if the girl needs to if the girl needs to have an uncle here as well, that means the boy and the girl have to be brother and sister in order to have the same uncle. Therefore, the boy is her brother. In a similar way, we are going to draw we have a similar situation here where we have a grandfather, grandfather, then we have the son of the son, son of the son, but then we also know that this is her grandfather as well, which means latter has to be his sister because they have the same grandfather. Her grandfather has a son who also has a son, that means this is her brother. For this question, we have to, this is logical sequence of words. We have to order the most logical sequence they would come in. So imagine you're coming home from work and you have to get in your room. So you would first put the key, if I can write, your key into the, the lock. So that means this would come second. And then that goes into the lock is within the door. So we have to have this third. So, so far we're going one, three, two. I think that we have our answer from now. Let's just confirm the rest. That door, once you get into the door, you have to enter the room. And then to enter the room, you have to switch on the light to make sure you can see when you get in. Therefore, C is going to be our solution. For this next one, out of all of these, we are going to have, for question 44, we are given words. So we know we have to start off with letters. This would be one. And then let's make up words. Words make up a phrase. And then the phrase makes up a sentence, which means the sentences make up a paragraph. So we'd have to start with one. We'd have to start with four, one, five, three. Four, one, five, three, which looks a bit like D. And then we have paragraphs at the end, which is our fifth position. For 45, we, have, we start with the crime. This will be number one. After the crime, who comes to the crime, the scene of the crime? We have the police. Then after the police, we get taken to the judge. And then after the judge, we have the judgment. The judge will judge. And then after that, we have the punishment. Which one looks like this? We have a D. So we have to, in the same sense, find a logical analogy between these two words. So there's a relationship with this. In the same way, there's a relationship with this. So if you imagine a cup, for example, a measuring jug, 
we have sort of the lip, which is where you pour your liquid from. In the same way, if you imagine a bird, you sort of have this bit sticking out, which is its beak. Birds don't have lips, but they have a beak. For question 47, what does the word stagnant mean? Stagnant means still. So with a river, we have waves. And then with stagnant, we have just the water standing still. So out of all of these, the pool is the most stagnant body of water. A canal has a light current going through it. It won't be crazy with waves. However, you do see the canal is not stagnant. There's um, animals moving through it, something like that. Rain is most definitely not stagnant. It is moving downwards. And then a stream has a little bit of a current as well. Therefore, it will be pool. For the next one, we are trying to find out which um, animal do these hands relate to. A paw is kind of a, hat, a cat's hands. So a hoof or a hoof relates to a horse. Or if it would have been a goat as well, but we don't have a goat here. But lions have paws, elephants have not hooves, and lambs don't have hooves either. A horse relates to a, um, a horse relates to hoof, hoof the most. This one kind of requires some common knowledge. Peacock is the national animal, or you can find them the most in India, so relating to geographical location. And bears, as of all of these places, you can find big Russian bears because Russia is quite a cold place. We have them in Russia. That's the VR section.